Today's presenters will be representatives from the 2019 Aura Awardee campuses, Bridgewater State University, Florida State University, and Occidental College. They will describe how their programs address diversity and inclusion in undergraduate research and how it continues to strengthen their programs. These institutions demonstrate how a dedication to diversity of undergraduates and academic fields, dissemination of student research, and continual assessment lead to success. Let me welcome today's presenters. Representing Bridgewater State University is Dr. Jenny Olin Shanahan, Assistant Provost for High Impact Practices. Representing Florida State University is Ms. Latika Young, Director for the Center for Undergraduate Research and Academic Engagement, and Ms. Alicia Batai, Associate Director at the Center for Undergraduate Research and Academic Engagement, and representing Occidental College, Dr. Ron Buckmeyer, Professor of Mathematics and Associate Dean for Curricular Affairs and Director of the CORE Program. It's now my honor to hand it over to our moderator, Dr. Donna Chamley Wick, the Assistant Dean for Undergraduate Research, Undergraduate Studies Associate Scientist in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at Florida Atlantic University, which her campus was recognized as an order or awardee in 2017. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, hi, everybody, and welcome to this uh, to this webinar. The campus-wide award for undergraduate research was established in 2015, and it was designed to publicly recognize institutions that have implemented many of the characteristics of excellence, divides innovative and exemplary programs, and have assessed the success of their efforts. Awardees have also demonstrated institutional depth and breadth of their undergraduate programs. Aura awards are given annually to institutions of all types and sizes. The Aura applications process occurs in two stages. Letter of intents are submitted to CUR during the spring as part of the first stage, and they're categorized into the three Carnegie classification categories and institution size, bachelors, masters, and doctoral. And the committee reviews and rates the proposals. A subset number of institutions are asked to move forward to the full proposal stage. Full proposals, once submitted, are also evaluated by a committee who rank all applications within each of the three categories and up to three awardees are selected based on applications submitted. Today's awardees are the fifth cohort of institutions so honored. Next slide, please. Awesome. Great. Aura is guided by the Characteristics of Excellence, which is a document that was published in 2012. CUR is a summary of best practices gleaned from CUR's long history of professional development institutes and other programs involving over 600 educational institutions. It addresses 12 major areas, 64 characteristics, and 202 assessable outcomes. It can be used as a guide for institutions to evaluate, foster, and sustain excellence in undergraduate research. Next slide, please. We are really proud to honor the 2009 Aura Awardees today through this webinar that highlights a central theme among all three winners, a theme of diversity, inclusion, uh, sorry, diversity and inclusion in undergraduate research. But before we move into hearing from the three selected programs, we wanted to take a moment to honor someone we recently lost, Dr. Karen Laughlin, Dean of Undergraduate Studies at Florida State University. She was an impassioned supporter of undergraduates, which was so evident when she accepted the Aura Award this past January at the AAC and U meeting. In the words of some of her colleagues, from Joe O'Shea, Assistant Provost from FSU, Karen understood the transformational power of undergraduate research and worked for years to expand student access to it. She was the driving force behind the establishment of FSU's undergraduate research office and a tireless advocate for its efforts. She will be deeply missed. From Ed Pratt, Dean of Undergraduate Studies at my institution, FAU, Karen's passing was a shock to so many of us. She was a friend and a mentor to all of the undergraduate deans throughout the state. She was also always generous with her advice, 
always willing to share what worked and also always willing to learn from others. Her top priority was always what was best for, for students. We will so miss her. Karen's efforts and those of her colleagues at FSU will be among the programs highlighted today. It is now my pleasure to turn the program over to our 2019 Aura Awardees. Hello everyone, this is Jenny Shanahan. I am at Bridgewater State University in Massachusetts and so honored not only to represent my institution uh, in the um, webinar here, but to have had the opportunity to speak to our colleagues about the work that we've been doing at Bridgewater State University to advance diversity, inclusion, and equity in undergraduate research through the Aura Award at AACNU. And now here in this webinar, I um, thank you, Donna, for the um, honoring of Karen. And I think we all feel like this is dedicated to her and, um, and her work is, is our work now that we need to carry on, right? Um, so I'm going to tell you about some things we've done at Bridgewater State in these areas um, and happy to take questions as has been stated. Um, those can go in the chat and those will be monitored and, um, and replied to after all three of us have presented. So Bridgewater State University has um, about 9,500 undergraduates and most of them are from underserved groups, students of color, low-income students, and or first-generation students. And our institution has a stated commitment to social justice. We have a social justice institute, but I think more importantly, it's, um, it's something that is more than lip service at our institution. In fact, the undergraduate research program that started 20 years ago is really rooted in uh, social justice and is seen as key to the university's equity promise. We know from lots of quantitative and qualitative data that participation in undergraduate research has been transformational for our students and especially so for our students from underserved groups. So we have um, corroborated the nationwide data about persistence in graduation rates increasing from participation in undergraduate research. That's been especially true for our first year students who get involved but also the qualitative parts of students reporting changes in what I would call their self-concept, their confidence, their reflection on the skills that they've gained. And they can see, and we have evidence to show, of course, that that participation in undergraduate research has been pivotal to their achieving their goals, both while they're students and for years after graduation. We've been working with the AACNU um, commitment as well to diversity, inclusion, and equity in high impact practices, and have especially worked with Vice President Tia McNair, who um, has been to our campus and, and supported some of our efforts and, and provided some professional development. And there's been a metaphor that um, Tia first um, told us that we've been using that may, you may enjoy too. You've probably heard that, um, that saying that diversity is like inviting everyone to the dance and inclusion is inviting them to dance. And Tia added something that, that I find really helpful, especially in terms of undergraduate research, that equity is about teaching the dance steps. And that ties so closely to the role of mentors in undergraduate research and those faculty as guides to students as they, they learn the landscape of research or scholarship in their fields. To achieve equity in undergraduate research, to teach the dance steps, if you will, uh, the, the research that Tia McNair has led and also I have found that the first step was for us to identify where the equity gaps are on our campus. So we have lots of nationwide data about the equity gaps for students of color, first generation students and low income students. At Bridgewater State, um, we've also looked at other groups of students who may not be participating as strongly as their peers in undergraduate research. So that's on the next slide. Thanks, Robin. Um, the, um, any student in a group that's been minoritized um, may be less likely to participate in high impact practices in an undergraduate research 
uh, specifically, and we have found that to be the case, LGBTQ students, students with disabilities, for example, but also students who are under extraordinary pressures outside of college. So our, our commuter students and those who are employed 20 hours a week or more, our part-time students, often um, have been approaching their education as quite pragmatically, you know, take their courses and earn their credential or degree and, um, and seeing that as a means to an end very um, in a very straightforward path, if at all possible. And we've sought to engage students um, in undergraduate research who may not see that as possible with their goals. So after looking at where those equity gaps are, our next step is really to think about ways we can close those equity gaps. And the ways we've done so at Bridgewater State, I would say fall into three categories the ways we recruit undergraduate researchers, the ways that we accept them into programs, and then, of course, the ways we, we support a diversity of students within those programs. So first I'll tell you about some recruitment efforts, um, four of them in particular. Um, one is our research internship program that is modeled on the University of Michigan's Europe program and that lots of institutions have also followed. Um, it's a program for first and second year students from underserved groups who work for pay as research assistants or interns with faculty mentors for about seven hours a week. We see a huge um, increase in those students' um, applications for undergraduate research grants in their junior and senior year. We also have invested a great deal in course-based undergraduate research. I would argue that that is our number one way to um, create equitable access to undergraduate research. If students are encountering research from their first semesters, and that's just what they do as students, then you've um, eliminated an enormous barrier to having to apply and seek out opportunities for students who may not have the resources to do that. The third recruitment effort we have is using um, you know, student employment funds to pay student ambassadors. So we have a diverse group of student ambassadors who give presentations at the Center for Multicultural Affairs, who visit club meetings for culture and identity clubs and safe spaces on campus such as the Pride Center and share their experiences as researchers. And they get training from us in what the resources are and how to get students started um, from a variety of majors and, um, and interests. And finally, um, honors programs are a great source of undergraduate researchers, right? Because in many programs such as ours, um, or including ours, honor students are doing an honors thesis that is an undergraduate research project. So if all of the honors students are gonna be doing undergraduate research, it really makes sense also to be looking at honors programs for diversity and inclusion. We did, um, we've done a number of things to diversify the honors program, and one of those has been eliminating SAT and ACT scores as a, um, as a gateway or whatever to, to honors. And um, so therefore, our honors students are more diverse, and so are our undergraduate researchers. The second area is in terms of how we accept students into undergraduate research opportunities, especially those that are tied to funding, so those that are not, um, simply course-based um, experiences. By the way, I should have said this earlier, I included photos and some captions of students to illustrate these various points, and I know that it's too much to listen and read all of that, but I knew that this would be recorded and um, hoping that people will um, be interested in going back and seeing some of these examples. But um, one of the um, things that I think is unusual from my conversations with others in Kerr is that we don't have a minimum GPA for undergraduate research grants, including our summer program. Um, and that is because we have all seen um, those students with the low two point something um, GPAs, like essentially see students who just come alive when they are given um, research opportunities. So that's been key to that um, diversity and inclusion. And we have non-competitive grants, um, small grants of $300 a semester that are semester project grants for expenses, supplies, equipment, travel, and conference travel grants of $1,000 for any student accepted to present at a national or regional conference, including undergraduate research conferences. Our other two acceptance practices um, are tied to our symposia. We have a very large um, mid-year symposium each December 
that is geared toward first year students. And they, uh, we have about 800 who present, about half of our first year class, and they're mostly presenting work from first year seminar, English composition, and other general education courses or intro courses in their potential majors. And then we have a student arts and research symposium each April that was held um, online this year with usually 1,000 to 1,100 students presenting work. And that can be from courses as well as, of course, from our summer program and things that they presented at, at national or regional conferences. And finally, our support for undergraduate researchers. It starts with the mentoring. That is key to helping students feel at home in undergraduate research. And we need to support those faculty mentors so that they can be great resources for our students. They are supported with funding during the summer, with teaching credit during the academic year, with tenure and promotion policies that reward undergraduate research mentoring, and with professional development to help them uh, troubleshoot and become even better mentors. Then where possible, we um, look at flexible scheduling for undergraduate research. That was the number one barrier that our students um, state to getting involved with undergraduate research, that they have work and family responsibilities that really limit their time and that often their schedules change from week to week. So working with faculty where possible to create some flexibility and um, creative problem solving to involve students um, who have those external pressures. And related to that, working with faculty to identify research opportunities that align with student interests, that honor our student experiences. So research shows, especially for students from underserved groups, that um, many are drawn to undergraduate research as a means of effecting justice and addressing problems in their own lives and especially in the lives of people in their communities. And so trying to um, create opportunities for that is really critical. Through all of these means, we have um, been able to um, have the rich diversity of our university reflected in our undergraduate research program. Um, in, this, in this bar graph, um, the orange is our undergraduate research program. The blue is the university as a whole. Um, the first is low-income students, where we're um, really well-matched. In first-generation students, where I actually have a stronger uh, representation in undergraduate research, and with our students of color, very close. So um, those are, are some of our benchmarks to see how we're doing there. And I'm happy to, um, as I said, take your questions at the end uh, and pass this off to my colleagues at Florida State. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Jenny, for that great presentation. I also really appreciate the reflections on Karen. As you can imagine, it has been a very rough week at Florida State, and it's hard to imagine moving forward without her guidance, but we know that she would want us to, so we will. But she should have been here presenting with us today, so we, we do miss her sincerely. So my name is Latika Young. I direct the Center for Undergraduate Research and Academic Engagement at Florida State University. We will abbreviate that CRE and FSU through this presentation, and I'm joined by my colleague. Alicia Bataille, the Senior Associate Director at the CRE. So before we get started, we did want to share that we're very happy to share our full application with any of you. You'll see our email addresses on our last slide. Um, if you would like that as a resource, um, and it will probably help elucidate some of the things we're talking about today, too, if you want to look at it in more detail. We also wanted to admit that this was our third time applying. I believe it was our third time. I think we've been a finalist at least once or twice in the past. I know somebody in last year's webinar mentioned they had also applied three times, and that gave us a little hope to keep applying. So if any of you are in the same boat, we encourage you not to give up quite yet. Next slide, please. So a little bit of our agenda, just to give you a sense of what we are trying to accomplish today. We'll position FSU, we'll highlight the five core characteristics that we discuss in our application. We'll talk about our exemplary program, which was the Undergraduate Research Opportunity Program. It probably sounds familiar to you. 
I will discuss a little bit about how we told our story. We wanted to show you how we presented in our application. Then we'll move into the bulk of the presentation on diversity and equity within the UREP program. We'll give you a bunch of examples um, from the data, and then we'll end with some takeaways and moving forward. Next slide, please. Positioning FSU. So we're located in Tallahassee, Florida. It is the capital of the state. We're a very high research university with nearly 42,000 students, with about 78% of those being undergrad students. We are an emerging Hispanic-serving institution. Currently, we're at 21.3% Latinx students. We have risen fairly dramatically in the U.S. News and World Report rankings over the last five years, so we are proud of that. We're currently the 18th top public university. We're tied with Penn State, Purdue, and University of Pittsburgh, and we joke that we, we mess up the alliteration of that group, unfortunately. We're the top 17th public for graduation rate of students receiving Pell Grants, so that's very important to us. Our six-year graduation rate is currently 83%, and our first-year retention rate is 94%. And we're proud to report that we've virtually eliminated disparities in our rates for underrepresented groups, including Pell Grant and first generation and college students. So we are in the CRE. We are part of the Honor Scholars and Fellows House in the center of campus, and we're located within the Division of Undergraduate Studies. Next slide. These are the five core characteristics that we chose to highlight in the bulk of our application. I won't read those, but you'll have the PowerPoint after. Next slide. Our exemplary program was the Undergraduate Research Opportunity Program, modeled after the program at University of Michigan. We are entering the ninth year of the program. It is an early immersion program, so it's targeted at first and second year students, and then we've intentionally created several cohorts for transfer students also. This last year, we saw about 425 students in the program, and we aim for about a 10% growth each year. For our Europe students, it's a three-part program. They enroll in a colloquium course that's taught by co-leaders to UROP leaders who are upper level students who've engaged in a lot of their own research. A lot of them went through the UROP program, but not necessarily. Our UROP students also do a research assistantship between five to 10 hours a week, and that's with a UROP research mentor who can be a faculty, a postdoc, a grad student, or a campus or community partner. And then all of our UROP students present at the Undergraduate Research Symposium in the spring. Next slide, please. So now we're moving into how we told our story. Um, we have three slides giving you a little bit more information about that. So our data sources. So we try to include a lot of table and charts within our application to tell a compelling visual and quantitative story, but that data came from pre and post Europe surveys that we've conducted every year over the course of the program. We also took this opportunity of this application to conduct a brand new alumni survey of our Europe students who've already graduated from the institution to try to get a sense of what their perceived uh, perceptions of the impact of the program are even moving forward into their careers in graduate school and what they're doing next. And then we also worked with Andrew Brady and our Office of Institutional Research to construct some comparison data. So we compared our Europe cohorts to our overall FSU cohort, and we also gained access to our graduating senior survey data. So all of our seniors um, take this internal survey and some of the questions in there are about their research engagement over the four years of their undergrad career. Next slide. This slide tells you a little bit or shows you a little bit about how we integrated student profiles into our application. So these are just two examples of students who both did Europe and then engaged in other programs that we run through our office. Next slide. And this slide shows you a little bit about formatting. So you'll see here on the right how we integrated the student profiles into the application. You'll see the appendix on the left, um, and you'll see that we kind of branded it with our FSU colors and tried to coordinate the application into an integrated whole. Next slide, please. Moving into the bulk of our presentation on diversity and equity within Europe. It also has three sections, so we'll look into recruiting and incentives, and then we'll discuss a little bit about how we define diversity, both between disciplinary and demographics, including some special populations that we target. And then we'll wrap up with ensuring, well, a discussion of how we ensure equity of participation and outcomes and what that looks like through the data. Next slide. Recruiting and incentives, uh, this is really important. We want to make sure that students know about our program and feel encouraged to apply. So we do send emails to all first year students so they can apply for their second year. And we work with admissions to send in emails to incoming students, um, first time in college students, and then also transfer students. 
And some of our internal surveys um, early in our year program showed that we had underrepresented departments, including nursing, business, fine arts, other creative programs. So we make sure we do intentional departmental outreach to those students and also faculty so those people know how to get engaged. And then we really rely on our campus partners, including CARE, we'll talk about them more, that's our center that supports first generation and college students, our honors program, our Office of National Fellowships, some of our offices that serve special population, including our Veterans Center, our Transfer Student Services, our Black Student Union, and other cultural and identity groups. And we also have a chapter of the Lois Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation on campus, so that is a great recruiting tool also for Europe. Two other elements that help with recruiting and incentivization of the program. All undergrads at FSU must now complete a formative experience at some time during their four years. So Europe counts for that, and that's really important. But probably the most important thing we've been able to accomplish in terms of making sure the program is accessible to all students is our collaboration with the Office of Financial Aid. So students in Europe can use their federal work study hours to fund their assistantship. Very important. I will turn it over to Alicia. Next slide, please. Thank you. So I wanted to go over uh, the data with diversity. So the data that we're talking about is between the years of 2012 to 2018, so the first six years of Europe. Um, and over those six years, most of Europe students have been STEM majors, so at 54%. And we really try to recruit students from less represented fields such as humanities, fine arts, and business. So while STEM participation has gone up a little bit in the last couple of years, we're really increasing our recruitment efforts from those um, <clears throat> less represented fields. Next slide. So in the, this slide, we are talking about uh, demographic diversity. Minority groups are overrepresented in Europe as compared to the university overall, except among Black and African American students. In the last two years, minority participation in Europe has gotten close to 50%, and Black and African American participation is around 10% in Europe compared to 9% overall at FSU. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So the Center for Academic Retention and Enhancement, also known as CARE, specifically provides support to first-gen students from low SES backgrounds. We work very closely with this center uh, for recruitment and looking at the six-year graduation rate of CARE students in Europe, it has been 100% compared to 74 to 80% with uh, the general CARE student population. And according to CARES director, Dr. Tadarel Stark, Europe has made research more accessible to these students, especially in their first two years. I do wanna point out that since we're analyzing the six-year graduation rate, <clears throat> and at this, the data that we're analyzing is only six years old, we only had two points to evaluate. Next slide, please. Another special population which has some overlap with CARE students are Pell eligible students. <clears throat> We really try to work hard um, to provide those students these opportunities. The four and six year graduation rate are much higher among Europe participants than the general university Pell eligible population. Europe has been more accessible to these students due to our partnership with the financial aid office. Um, through that partnership, we were able to offer federal work study research positions to eligible students, allowing them to focus on research rather than another campus job. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Uh, so transfer students is another population we're really excited to recruit. Um, we didn't start transfer student specific sections in Europe until 2014, but since then we've increased outreach to community colleges both locally and statewide, specifically contacting honors directors and academic advisors to pass along this information. We also work with admissions at FSU to email admitted transfer students about Europe. <clears throat> um, transfer student and veteran Daniel Hubbard who was on the last slide, uh, also felt that Europe was an enriching educational experience that helped him win an IDEA grant, one of FSU's summer undergraduate research grants, as well as being named a Truman Scholar. Next slide, please. So this is data from our Europe alumni survey. We had developed specifically for this AURA application. Overall, alumni felt their participation in Europe led them to 
um, <clears throat> participate in campus engagement opportunities as well as become campus leaders as expected. They also felt your app led them to engage more in undergraduate research opportunities, but it also helped clarify their career goals and the desire to pursue a graduate degree. Next slide, please. The, this is the graduating senior survey and through our partnership with institutional research, we were able to analyze this data. It is a voluntary survey, but most students think it's required. All your op students worked with a research mentor, which is a requirement of pro this program, um, compared with seven to eight percent of non your op students. Independent research under faculty supervision is nearly 10 times higher in your op seniors compared to non your op graduating seniors at FSU. And then <clears throat> on the next slide, I'll talk about takeaways and moving forward. We made sure to highlight the overall benefits of Europe, specifically higher retention rates and graduation rates, both generally and across special populations. We were not able to run a controlled study to remove selection bias, but our data was still very compelling. It is essential to have financial support for students from low SES backgrounds to make research more accessible, and we were able to do that through our partnership with the Financial Aid Office and Federal Work Study. Moving forward, um, we constantly have the challenge of recruiting students from non-STEM majors, especially humanities um, and fine arts and business. <clears throat> we really want to ensure representation of diversity, both demographically and disciplinary, and we do a lot of that through our partnerships on campus. Um, <clears throat> one of the challenges that we didn't mention is that we have some loss of diversity through our Europ leaders, those students that um, teach the Europe colloquium. <clears throat> so we're creating a Europe leader committee focused on diversity and equity in the program and using the students to help us um, <clears throat> tackle this issue. And on the final slide, it's our contact slide. Um, and feel free to reach out if you'd like to review a full copy of our application. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Ron Buckmeyer, and I'm going to talk to you about the Undergraduate Research Center at Occidental College. Next slide. So, Occidental College is a private, small liberal arts college in Northeast Los Angeles. We have around 2,000 students, about an eighth of them are first generation, a little over a third are students of color, about three quarters receive financial aid. And we have students from 46 states, DC, and 58 countries. About 7% of our students are international. So uh, in relation to those 2,000 students, we have about 150 tenure and tenure track faculty. And uh, we have uh, 40 areas that students can major in from um, black studies to critical theory and social justice to kinesiology. Uh, the most popular major on campus is economics. Uh, we have a uh, $450 million endowment. Uh, next slide. And uh, uh, our cost of attendance is about $75,000 a year, but we have a 42% discount rate. So the average uh, student pays around $30,000. Um, Occidental, so now I want to talk about uh, research at Occidental. We've um, had faculty, some form of faculty mentor, mentor research since the 1950s. However, the Undergraduate Research Center, which is the uh, main program that our uh, application was built around, was established in 1998 as a result of a federal grant from the National Science Foundation um, that helped sort of uh, seed the activities uh, that we uh, that we did to support undergraduate research, and then the college instituted uh, institutionalized uh, that program. Uh, the Undergraduate Research Center, which I'll call by URC, supports about 350 students a year. Only about a third of them are in the summer research program, and two thirds are um, uh, supported, just like other um, uh, applicants have, have said, that we have uh, small grants, $250 or so, to support um, materials and supplies for faculty student one on one research in uh, labs and studios and off campus. Um, but the uh, sort of the jewel of our uh, URC is what we call the SRP, the Summer Research Program, 
And the summer research program focuses on um, uh, inquiry, design, and interpretation. So inquiry of about um, new about new knowledge, um, uh, design of uh, projects, etc., and interpretation uh, it could be artistic interpretation. Another key focus is collaboration, collaboration between uh, students and faculty, and also between the students and the program themselves. Ethical conduct is a, another key component, and then communication of original, of original results. Next slide. So the, uh, so our summer research program is a 10 week residential program. Um, uh, just as an aside, uh, this summer, uh, we're changed it to an eight week um, uh, virtual uh, experience. And surprisingly, we found about 70% of the projects that um, uh, had been planned uh, are able to sort of move online or, or to be virtual. So uh, in our residential program, in, our, in the usual 10-week residential version, uh, one way we try to um, encourage uh, diversity of participants is that there is a uh, three-tiered price structure uh, for housing. Uh, depending on your financial aid, um, the housing costs will be um, differentiated. Uh, we have a stipend um, that of $4,500. Uh, that stipend had not, so that's below uh, minimum wage in LA County. Um, and it's it's always been below minimum wage, uh, but it, at least it's closer than it was. Uh, when I became associate dean, The I, I was able to negotiate the first increase in the stipend in over a decade. Uh, the SRP includes a mandatory ethics training, which occurs at um, sort of the, the signature event of the SRP, which is a weekly uh, 200 person lunch and seminar. So we have we have about, as I said, about 100, 110, uh, 115 uh, students, and then all their mentors. Um, and every week we have presentations from Occidental faculty, either on ongoing research projects in order to sort of advertise uh, uh, what future, what projects the current SRP students could work on during the semester, or to provide examples of previous work that previous students had uh, done in, in other in prior years at SRPs. In addition, um, at this weekly seminar, we uh, try to uh, provide opportunities for students to learn about national awards and fellowships. Occidental College is a small private liberal arts college. We sort of punch above our weight in this area. Um, we've had numerous um, NSF graduate research fellows and uh, Fulbright Award winners, Rhodes Scholars, um, Marshall Scholars, et cetera. And part of, the, part of um, our uh, way of doing this is making sure students are aware of these opportunities um, early and often. Uh, we also provide information about graduate school um, and uh, we do not sort of privilege any one um, career trajectory, uh, but we do encourage students to be thinking about what their post-graduation plans will be, uh, to realize um, that networking is important, that the uh, mentoring relationship that they are establishing during this summer uh, will be helpful in, in the future when they need a uh, reference uh, for a job or in graduate school. Um, the I want to end with uh, uh, some, some statistics about uh, the SRP for the last five years. We've had um, good representation from arts, the humanities, sciences, and social sciences. Um, for the last two or three years, um, uh, the, the number of students in the arts has been increasing because we were able to receive um, uh, two, um, Mellon, two grants from the Mellon Foundation. Uh, I want to end by um, uh, thanking uh, our Director of Undergraduate Research, uh, Janet Morris, who was um, the person primarily responsible for us uh, doing this uh, oral award application. Um, it was the 20th year of the, of the program last year in 2019, and um, we applied for the first time. We didn't really expect to get it. <laughs> uh, so Janet said, and we're very happy that we did. And um, 
if anyone is interested in seeing our application, uh, this is my contact information and I'm happy to share it. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, this is Donna again. I wanted to thank our panelists for sharing their expertise and experiences with the Aura Award. And again, um, congratulate all of them on this accolade. Um, I know when we got it, we were very excited, so I can only imagine how you guys feel um, by being uh, the recipients of such a prestigious award. I think now the audience can see why Kurt chose to recognize these three outstanding institutions for their undergraduate research programs. What I'd like to do now is transition to the question section, and I will be happy to facilitate directing the questions to the panelists. Thanks to Robin, she's been um, sending those questions, and so I've created a list, and we'll just run down the list, and as you have additional questions, feel free to put it into the chat box, and we can divide it and conquer it accordingly. Okay, so the first question goes, um, and I'd like to direct this one first to Occidental, and that is, what ideas um, can you share, Ron, for campuses with small enrollments that are not as diverse as they would like to be? How do you recruit more diverse students, particularly if your institution is not a very large uh, STEM-focused institution? Thank you for the question. One of the ways that we thought about diversifying our undergraduate research participation in the undergraduate research center was really expanding disciplines um and it turns out that um we're currently overrepresented in uh, first generation students we're still represented in um uh minoritized students but we really but since um the underrepresentation is oftentimes and also at Occidental quite severe in STEM disciplines, that was one of that was one of the impetuses for us expanding and making sure that we have good participation from all divisions, from social sciences, from arts and humanities, um, et cetera. Now if you're saying that you don't have a large STEM um, representation at your institution, and you're not divorce, not and and you're not diverse in other areas. Uh, what can you do? Um, I admit I'm sort of stumped. Um, yeah. yeah, maybe someone else has an idea. Sure. Do any of the other panelists have ideas? This is Jenny Shanahan. I can't speak to the small institution necessarily, except that. Um, well, I did spend the first 10 years of my career at a small institution, but the um, the use of some student employment funding for student ambassadors has been crucial for us in attracting students who we were otherwise having trouble reaching. Excellent. Thanks so much, Jenny and Ron. Okay, um, so the next question goes out to uh, Bridgewater State. So Jenny, I'll direct this one to you. And that is, how have you funded your paid internships, your cures, and your grants that you described? Okay, thanks. I, I always hesitate a little at this question because we have an extraordinarily large budget for undergraduate research out of academic affairs. And I say that um, with some caution because I don't want people to despair. We did not start with a, with a huge budget um, in academic affairs. We started with funding from the foundation, so alumni funding and faculty advocacy for that funding. And then as, as the institution and, the, and those involved with undergraduate research were able to show that in many ways this program pays for itself in retention and graduation rates. You know, the, 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 the biggest cost savings to an institution come with retaining our students. And those who were getting involved in course-based research, especially first year seminar and English composition, we could see that, that they were significantly more likely to stay for their second year and to graduate on time. So we wanted to, we just kept showing data, going back with requests each year, and um, now most of it is funded through academic affairs. 
Fantastic. Yes, that's that's good to hear. And the alignment to retention and graduation rates, I think all of our institutions can relate to. So that was a great add on, Jenny. Thanks so much. Um, we have a follow up question, and I would like to have this addressed um, perhaps by all three institutions. What type of um, and maybe we start with FSU. What type of professional development opportunities do you offer for your faculty? Are there things that you can describe with regards to what you offer for your faculty? Sure, we can start. Um, we don't necessarily do a lot of that in-house, but we partner with our Center for the Advancement of Teaching at Florida State and um, have worked with them to kind of develop some trainings we're thinking about doing some book clubs some of this is on hold now this is a new institution at florida state um we have done a little bit more training for our graduate students we have a like a kind of a webinar or online portal that they can do um it's a little bit harder to require faculty to do things to engage in our ur program but we feel a little bit more confident um kind of requiring or strongly encouraging our graduate students to do more of this training so that's something we're building out especially now that we're in this virtual capacity, we wanna build out a little bit more of that, um, at least create something for faculty that they can opt into, but we don't have currently a lot of our own in-house professional development. Great. Um, Ron and uh, Jenny, any additions on the development of faculty? Yeah, I, I could jump in. Um, we've done a couple of things um, that are mostly related to a very grassroots approach to peer-to-peer -peer faculty development and that's been the the best um method that i see in terms of inviting faculty to things um so like yesterday we had our virtual orientation for our summer undergraduate research program and um all the faculty mentors showed up and they um are provided with development from last year's faculty mentors so we asked last year's mentors like what do you wish you knew or what are some guidelines? How do you do certain things? And we have categories that we ask them to speak to. Like how do you organize your meetings with your students and how do you structure um, their interim deadlines and, and things like that? Because we have um, from all across the disciplines. So the, the humanities faculty will approach it differently than the, the lab sciences, et cetera. And then the other thing is through the academic year to have occasional brown bag um, sessions that we're going to continue in the summer just um, through Microsoft Teams, where there'll be a topic that is common to faculty mentors, like how do you write with your students? Um, and then have three or four faculty from different disciplines who've published with students kind of share their troubleshooting and their ideas. So very much peers speaking to peers has been the approach. Great, thanks so much. Okay, Maybe. Oh. go ahead, Ron. I was gonna say at Occidental, uh, we also have a Center for Teaching Excellence and we, because we're a small Rhodes College, we have a required uh, senior thesis that, so faculty sort of have experience working one-on-one -on -one with, um, students in the form of a sort of a long-term project and i think they generally use that experience uh, to help them with um, summer research experiences fantastic you know this this idea of um partnering with other units on campus um the idea of training the next generation of faculty these are all very transferable ideas that i'm sure that you can think about and we can all think about bringing back to our institutions we wanted to talk a little bit next, um, since we're on the topic of development, there was a follow-up question about um, what kind of ethics training does Occidental College use? Is it city training? Uh, who can attend those training sessions? And then a final question for all three panelists of what other types of trainings do you offer to your, to your students? So let's start with Ron at Occidental. Yes, it is the city training. Okay, cool. Are there other ethics trainings that are done at the other two institutions? Sure, Alicia, do you want to talk about our trainings that are part of Europe? I mean, we have the course itself, so all of our students actually engage in a training over the course of the year. It's a biweekly course, but then we have some specialized training for students in the program. Alicia, if you want to talk about the... Yeah, um, yeah so we partnered with our environmental health and safety department that um, 
curates all of the typically STEM labs and biohazard, and they have a training that they do specifically for Europe students um, about general lab safety. Excellent, thank you. I know other universities do um, sort of like semester long course training opportunities. Uh, we have one of those at FAU and if anybody wants copies of syllabi, I know the Kerr unit is very, you know, welcome to share. All right, so let's move on to some of the other questions. Um, so the next question that came in um, is asking if you guys could describe more of your strategies for recruiting non-STEM faculty, the strategies for recruiting non-STEM faculty. I can direct that. Oh, go ahead. Uh, were you going to direct it to me? <laughs> yes, I was. <laughs> this is Jenny Shanahan. I always, this is my passion and this is what I um, write about. So that's why I was like, I want that question. Um, my PhD is in <laughs> literature um, and I've been involved. I was one of the founding members of the Kerr Arts and Humanities Division. Very um, glad to have been part of that for many years. We, um, I well, well, what I often say is, first of all, let those humanities faculty lead for what undergraduate research um, you looks like for them. And and the term undergraduate research is a problem from the outset. It is not the term that we we don't use the term research typically for our own scholarship. I think most um, humanities faculty are getting to be OK with that because we know what we mean. But if you're at a campus that has not had faculty really active in undergraduate research from the humanities, that's part of it. Um, as Ed Ayers said years ago at a Kerr um, national meeting um, keynote address, he said, he's a historian, he said, research is what we do kind of as background work to produce scholarship. So if you start to talk with faculty about scholarly practices, and ask them, what do you do? And what do you do in your classes? And what do your students do? They'll come out with like, oh, well, my students do undergraduate research. And then um, a lot of that will happen in courses. And um, I think that that's great. And that's um, often where lots of people get started. And it will often happen on individual projects. So they may be smaller. They may be dyads as opposed to um, having large lab groups that's okay. And then you can bring together the groups of like in the whole English department, um, undergraduate researchers can, can meet together occasionally as a kind of a, um, a team, even though they're working on separate projects. And then the digital humanities has been an enormous area of growth for undergraduate research in our fields. So lots of faculty who are involved with digital humanities projects need a team of, of researchers essentially to help them produce that digital content. So that, that's a summary. There are a couple of Kerr books and Kerr institutes and things like that that, that get at that too. But um, my main thing is if the science faculty try to in, just invite the humanities faculty into existing structures, it won't make sense to them. But if they can design structures for themselves um, and get support for it, it'll flourish. Yeah, I would just quickly agree with that from Occidental College. From the time the uh, FC, our URC was created, we always talked about inquiry and investigation and interpretation as um, in, and over, as a and use research as an overarching term. But the practices were always emphasized. Uh, to be uh, multimodal and multifaceted. Nice. I'd love to chime in here too, because this is really important for us at Florida State. Um, even through the URAP program, we're trying to keep it at about 50% STEM participation. So that requires a lot of research mentors who are non-STEM too. Um, we're lucky to have some materials grant funding. So it's up to $500 per student, up to two students for faculty. But so that's $1,000. For a STEM researcher, that's really nothing. So it's maybe not a big incentive. But for somebody who's making a film or needs access to some archives or something, that's actually a, a great incentive. And I know we're lucky to have that funding. Um, and then we also really rely once 
faculty are engaged in Europe and have good experiences, when we do our departmental meetings and our outreach, we make sure to have them speak about their experiences. And as Jenny said, that kind of word of mouth peer to peer is extremely helpful. And then one other small incentive that might be able to be recreated more easily than our materials grant funding is we do a Europe Research Mentor Award each year. And we make sure that, that you know the discipline of the recipient changes around uh, every year. But that's a $2,000 award that we give. And that's helpful, I think, to engage faculty and just gain recognition because it's also awarded at the campus-wide faculty award ceremony in the spring. So that brings some attention to our non-STEM participating faculty too.